Hi, my name is Dave and I will be your host for tonight's event. I want to thank the camera store for putting this on and tonight we are tuning in with Alberta Scenic Photography Guide with Dale Leckie. Now there's a bunch of work that goes on behind the scenes to make this all work and we have Gary and Chris behind the scenes here, part of our TCS TV live dream team. So hopefully everything's going to go without a hitch but things have happened in the past so make sure you stay tuned. We'll keep up comments posted in the, uh, in the comment section here as we're going through. Now part of what I love about doing live streams is the ability to interact with everybody and we have a great audience here tonight um, online so I'm looking forward to fielding a whole bunch of questions. Now what's going to happen tonight is um, Dale's going to have a great presentation here and feel free to pose questions to the room and I'm going to compile them and put them all together at the end for a question and answer period. So it should be pretty interesting here. If you don't want to join the chat form, by all means, just send me an email. It's just dave at thecamerastore.com. So if you are not already familiar with tonight's guest, Dale Leckie, PhD, is a geologist known around... Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> known around here as the author of a few publications, including his most recent book, the, Sci the Scenic Geology of Alberta, which topped Alberta's bestseller list this year. So welcome, Dale, to the, hey. to the program here. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Uh, so before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to create this book? It's something I've wanted to do probably for 20, 25 years. I retired seven years ago, and that gave me the opportunity to write these books. I've always been taking people into the mountains, people into the prairies, to see and learn about the landscapes and to appreciate them. So that's what drove me. Cool. How, how does this book differ from like um, a geology book, like a typical book? Oh, uh, I think if it was a geology book, it would scare most of the people <laughs> in the audience. So I wrote it 
for the travelers, naturalists, photographers who want to go visit the province, who want to go and get out. Mm. I, w I didn't want to make it very technical at all. And I've tried to keep it so people could understand it, use it, and appreciate it. Yeah, I know Alberta has like a very, a really cool, a lot of uh, geology here, uh, like within close context of, of where Calgary is. So uh, give us an overview of what our viewers are going to learn about tonight. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take people all around Alberta. I'm going to show them a lot of the scenic sites. I'm going to tell them how they originated. And then I'm going to leave them with pictures and images, which hopefully they can go back and find those spots and get the right light, get the right time of day, and capture their own, their own images. I'm going to take people around the province, show them places, and tell them how these spectacular scenic sites of Alberta originated. Well, this is, uh, this is great. I mean, I've lived here pretty much all my life, but I'm always learning about Alberta, so I, I can't wait to get into it. So let's get right into your presentation. Hey, that sounds really good, Dave. Okay. So thanks to the camera store. I really appreciate it and everybody in the audience. So consider this as Alberta's Scenic Photography Guide. And it's based on the most recent book that I did, The Scenic Geology of Alberta, a roadside touring and hiking guide. And so what I want to do is take you to the scenic sites across the province. And then I want to explain their origins. And those origins are going to be geological. There's going to be a little bit of cultural in there as well. Just some of the images, some of the places you can go and visit in this province. This is Cypress Hills. It's south of Cypress Hills Provincial Park, looking south. And you can see the prairie landscape from the knoll that you're on. You can see the sweet grass hills way in the distance to the south. Dinosaur Provincial Park, known for its dinosaurs, but just got spectacular, spectacular scenery to look at. Outcrops is what geologists call them. Just a multitude, a plethora of colors. So the way I've set the talk up is the scenic geology of Alberta is a story of unbridled power. It's a story of drama. It's a story of glaciers and volcanoes long past. And it's a story of banks, how, of when banks fail. That's how I'm going to get you traveling the <coughs> province. I'm trying to make geology interesting to people. Pine Ridge Lookout, just at the entrance to Waterton Lakes National Park. And that's not cloud, that's smoke from a few years ago. Just spectacular scenery. Chief Mountain from Police Outpost Provincial Park. And Police Chief Mountain is in northernmost Montana, about six, ten kilometers south of the border. But it's a landmark in southwest Alberta. Riding on Stone Provincial Park, Isonipe National Historic Site. That's just such an amazing story there. And then the First Nations recorded history on the walls, on the walls of the rocks we're going to look at. Everybody goes to Dinosaur Provincial Park to look at the dinosaurs. But there's also the landscape, the topography. This is Scablands and Badland topography. Milk River Canyon, probably one of the prettiest places in Alberta as far as I'm concerned. It might even be better, prettier, more spectacular than the Icefields Parkway. Um, but again, that's just a matter of opinion. <clears throat> Aretha Van Herc, the Alberta author, she wrote for the book, um, visible Alberta is stunningly beautiful, but the poetry of geology is its secret language, a transcendent stratigraphy. So what is stratigraphy? All it is, is the layers of the rocks. And here's Dry Island Buffalo Jump, northeast of Calgary. And you've got these great pastel colors interrupted, separated by those coal horizons, those continuous coal layers. You can do close-ups. Here are cracks in mud that are 1.5 billion years old. And that's in Waterton Lakes Provincial Park. Um, just again, beautiful red colors and then coated with lichen. Crow's Nest Mountain and the Crow's Nest Pass. And there's a story there as well. And that's what we talk about in the scenic geology of Alberta, in the book. We take people around the province, much like I'm showing in these maps here, to various sites across southern, central, and northern Alberta to look at the spectacular landscapes. <clears throat> I was lucky enough to work with two artists. Um, Brent Laycock does acrylics on canvas, and he put eight of his paintings into the book. Lucy Carriou put eight watercolors into the book, and these are all landscapes. And so the, the viewer, the person that's looking at the landscape, taking the pictures, it, taking in the natural history, you can see the landscape, you can see the terrain, through the eyes of a geologist, a scientist like myself, and through the eyes of an artist. 
So I really appreciate having that art in there. So get your camera, fill your car with gas. It's time to explore and learn how Alberta's most scenic sites were created. The scenic geology of Alberta is all about unbridled power. So we'll start here by going to Waterton Lakes National Park and you're at the Bison Paddock Lookout, just on the north side of the park. And what you see there are rocks that are 1.5 billion years old and they've been pushed to the northeast um, oh, 150, 160 million years until 60 million years ago. And the times don't matter, a long time ago. And then in front of it, you've got the Rocky Mountain foothills, which look markedly different than the foothills west of Calgary, west of Edmonton, when you're going into Jasper. Setting the stage for this part of the talk, this is what North America looked like 1.5 billion years ago. Waterton Lakes National Park was located south of the equator, it was a hot and harsh environment and there was not a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere or in the waters at that time. So think of a coastal environment, something like this, 1.5 billion years ago. There was no life on land at the time. All there was was algae. So I say that algae ruled the world. And what you can see here are colonies of algae called stromatolites. And they, if you cut them, or not if you cut them, if you take a Brussels sprout or if you take a cabbage and cut it in half vertically, you will see bedding, you'll see layers, much like you see in these stromatolites. Stromatolites are algae, that's all they are. They've got a sticky surface and when mud falls on them, you get these laminations, these, these lines forming like this. Algae ruled the world at the time. Here's another picture on your left. Um, 1.5 billion year old stromatolites. On the right side, are some stromatolites, one of the few, few places on Earth where they occur from west coast of Australia, Shark Bay. There it's a really hot embayment, it's really hot climate, very dry, and this is a bay, an embayment. The seawater evaporates and the salt stays in the water, it gets saltier and saltier. And it may, it's not a very good place for animals to live. There's no snails there. Snails, if you think about what you do with your fish tank, when you've got algae, growing on your fish tank. You put snails in there to eat the algae. Well, there's nothing to eat the algae here. So you've got modern stromatolites and you've got those 1.5 billion year old ones. And they form the rocks in Waterton Lakes National Park. If you go to Cameron Falls, shown here, you can, you, and if you walk through those cliffs, you can find stromatolites like that, algae, and that's all that there was on Earth at the time. So we're talking about unbridled power. Here's a Google Earth image of southwestern Alberta, northern Montana, and you can see Calgary in the distance, Banff, Crow's Nest Pass, and Waterton. <clears throat> and what, you, what I want you to think about, and we're talking about how these, this beautiful scenery got here, is you've got this mass of rocks, that's a rocks, mass of rocks, which are 140 kilometers by 40 kilometers across. They're about seven kilometers thick. They were buried about 10 kilometers deep. And they were situated about 140 kilometers to the southwest. And by mountain building, they were pushed to where we see them today. And that took place 165 to 60 million years ago. And then there was about 10 kilometers of erosion and you get the mountains that we see today in Waterton Lakes National Park. So this is a picture from Bear's Hump. And you can see those mountain sheep, those mountain ranges, which originated 140 kilometers to the southwest. That's power. Consider the forces involved. Again, <clears throat> go back to this Google Earth image and you'll see where the next two slides are. And if you go to the south side of the park and look north, you can see the Waterton River Valley. You can see mountains in through here. Imagine those mountains being pushed into place like that at millimeters per year. Go around the corner where the next slide is and you can see the front of that thrust sheet, those mountains, and you can just envisage them being pushed towards you. But they were buried about 10 kilometers deep. And then we've got these spectacular glacial deposits in front, capping the Rocky Mountain foothills there. Let's go to Red Rock Coulee, natural area. So Medicine Hat, west of Calgary, and drive south. Um, and you're gonna to go to Red Rock Coulee Natural Area, and you see these large boulders. They're actually calcite concretions. 
made out of a chemical precipitate, calcium carbonate, and they litter the landscape there. People, some people call it a moonscape. And they all seem to originate from one horizon, where this light gray layer of rocks, which is a volcanic ash layer, where it originates. And then they work and weather their way down into the gullies. And that's what you're seeing here. Here's that same ash layer, volcanic ash layer, and the concretions are weathering out of the hills here. When you go into the badlands, every time there's a thunderstorm or a series of thunderstorms in the summer, they, they erode. They erode from the tops and they erode from the sides. And they'll erode at about half a centimeter per year, which is really pretty quickly, pretty quick. And as a result, these concretions, these large boulders, make their way to the surface and then they start to slip. They creep down slope. And you can see these ones are all dipping on that surface. And they're eventually going to make their way down into the gullies where they become concentrated. So how did they originate? 75 million years ago, there was a shallow sea that occupied western Canada. Alberta, Saskatchewan, into Montana, went down into the Gulf of Mexico. And in that shallow sea, the water depths were probably a few meters to a few tens of meters. And then these concretions, this calcite precipitated just below the seafloor in the muds on the bottom of that shallow sea. And that's what gives you that terrain. And now they're weathering out. Remember, badlands topography, weathering out half a centimeter per year, and we get these littering the surface. You can see in the concretions evidence of that old seafloor. There are ripples from the seafloor. There are worm burrows that you can see. There are shell, there's shell debris. Sometimes you can find fish debris, wood debris. Um, and they are the nucleus on which this calcite precipitated to give, the, to give you these really hard circular features. Sometimes they break open like this. And if you look very carefully in the lower right corner, you can see these circular rings. They show how the concretions grew out in the mud when they were buried on that seafloor. About 15 kilometers north of Red Rock Coulee at Bullshead Butte, the paleontologists have found this fossil. It's called a prognothodon. It was about 10 meters across, so it was the size of a small school bus. It was the top of the food chain. It ate what it wanted, when it wanted. And that's why I put it in here. It was unbridled power, which lived in the seas at the time. Here's a watercolor by Lucy Carew, um, Red Rock Coulee. And I think she's captured the essence of the moonscape very, very nicely there. More unbridled power. <clears throat> let's go to Sulphur Gates and let's look at a water gap. So we're going to go west of Edmonton, Highway 16, go north to Grand Cache, Sulphur Gates Provincial Recreation Area. And there's this resistant ridge of conglomerate. And all a conglomerate is, is a cemented gravel. And it's tightly cemented. But the river, the Smoky River flowing through here, has created what's called a water gap. A narrow gorge where a river cuts through a resistant ridge. And it, again, spectacular foothills scenery. So what we've got here is the Smoky River flowing through that resistant ridge. You've got the Sulphur River, which is just a small little river, and it doesn't have the same kind of horsepower to do erosion. It's trapped between these ridges. And then it comes in and joins the Smoky River here. And again, very, very, very spectacular scenery. Consider the power that's needed, required, to erode that gap. The scenic geology of Alberta is about drama. Battle scenes written in stone, and for this we're going to go to Writing on Stone Provincial Park, Isonipe National Historic Site. So south of Lethbridge, and then east and right on to the border. It's just six kilometers north of the U.S.-Canada border. And it's the Milk River. It is, this is the Milk River. It was cut by a glacial lake, which the valley was cut by a river that drained from a glacial lake and cut this broad valley. And then later, the Milk River occupied that va river valley. There are hoodoos there, and that's, one of the, that's what gives the park, the river valley, so much character. And what's a hoodoo? Most people will know what they are. Well, they've got cap rocks of, that are more resistant than the underlying 
resistant to erosion than the underlying rocks. So whenever there's windstorms, rainstorms, uh, really bad blowing snow, loose sand grains come off these hoodoos, the lower parts of the hoodoos, and the cap rocks aren't eroded as much. And that's how we get these forms. You see them in here. Very mystical shapes. There's the valley again, and you can see the Milk River cutting through it. You can see a tributary valley, uh, a gully coming in from the U.S. And the cliffs, what are they? Why are they there? What, what's the story? Well, 84 million years ago, there was a, a, a shoreline. There was a beach here that was moving from south to north. So this, these ridges forming the valley walls are an ancient shoreline. You've got muds from that seaway right at the base, a thick sandstone, which was that shoreline moving forward, coals and rivers on top. So I'm trying to give you a picture of what the scenery looks like. So here's a picture, here's one drawing. And there was a shoreline, there was a sea, a shoreline that was moving from south to north. And at Riding on Stone Provincial Park, we can see evidence of a barrier island. We can see a tidal inlet. You can see other features with shallow shoals, names don't really matter. And if you were there at the time, 84 million years ago, you could have surfed out in front in southern Alberta. You could have swam or used taking your paddleboard into the lagoon, the estuary, or the bay. Use whatever terms you want. There's a picture of what it looked like in southern Alberta 84 million years ago. Let's go on a hike. Let's go from the upper part of these cliffs and let's go down to the bottom. And when you get to the bottom, and you go on a hike with the park interpreters, and there are these pictographs. There are the line drawings of telling First Nations history, um, events that have happened in the past. And this particular one is called Retreats Up the Hill Battle. And it probably took place 1866. And it's a story that was related by the Pecani bird elder, a bird, bird, Pecani elder named Bird Rattle, about 1920 or so. And he tells the story of when a tri when a war party of Gros Ventre, Crow, and Plains Cree were coming into the area to attack the Blackfoot people. We know that this took place after um, co European contact. There are horses and there are guns. There's not a photo of this because it's about three meters across and you just can't capture it. But what you can see here, horses with travois on the right, you can see guns from the war party. You can see a line of muskets here shooting musket balls. If you do take a look at one of the photos or a close up, you can see the scratches, the etchings in the rock, and you can see those muskets. You can see the musket balls coming out where they were defending and protecting themselves. The Blackfoot won this battle. They were they they were they they defended themselves against the attacking war party. Again, we're looking at that ancient shoreline, at those shoreline deposits, at those sands. And what you see etched here is another battle scene. And in this one, what you see are people walking and they've got these large shields. They've got these large circular features in front of them. And these are horse, these are bison hide shields. They're so big that even if there were horses, they'd be very difficult to carry on a horse for protection. But there's no horses in this image. There's no guns in this image. The two inverted warriors, the two inverted people here are probably warriors. So part of the story at Writing on Stone uh, Provincial Park. And there's Lucy's rendition. Drama. The Cretaceous, Cretaceous Gold and the Lost Lemon Gold Mine. If you drive up and down the Rocky Mountain foothills, from Bragg Creek to the Montana border, you can quite often find gravel ridges like this. And there's a story in there, and it relates to the Lost Lemon Gold Mine. For most of what we'll talk about here, we're going to go down to the Frank Slide Interpretive Center in the Crow's Nest Pass. And <clears throat> if you go into the parking lot, uh, park your car, drive up on the hill, or walk up onto the hill just beside the parking lot, you can see this conglomerate ridge. You can see a gravel ridge, cemented gravel conglomerate in through here if you go for a hike. And you're right in the middle of these ancient river deposits. And that's what the story is here. You can see these gravel ridges, and in the background, you can see Turtle Mountain, Frank Slide. So the story here is there were two trappers, Blackjack and Lemon. Um, they discovered gold. 
in the east uh, west sorry east of east in the Rocky Mountains, um, either east or west of the great of the divide into British Columbia. The story I'm going to suggest is they probably found it east of the divide. Um, two two trappers, Blackjack and Lemon, they put, discovered gold. One night they got into a fight. Lemon killed Blackjack. He became unstable. Um, he wandered into Montana, Tobacco Plains area, told his story. And then after that, colorful people with colorful names like Lafayette French, King Bearspaw, John McDougall, and the Blackfoot woman, Cloud Walker, they all searched in vain for the gold. There is said to be a curse, tragic deaths, fires, storms, serious illness that afflict those people that look for the gold. But to me, that was just life in the 1800s. If you look at the legend, you see the name Dutch Creek, Racehorse Creek, Highwood River, Gold, Gold Creek, Old Man River, keep cropping up. And they are all rivers south of Calgary, south of Bragg Creek, down to the Montana border. And those gravels define, if you look at them in the outcrop, in the mountains, they define a series of channels, river valleys that flowed from west to east. And there were eight of them that have been identified south of Calgary. Details don't matter, except they're part of the story here. If you look at the pebbles in there, there's volcanic rocks, there's igneous rocks in there. And those volcanics and igneous rocks come from east central British Columbia, the same area where gold occurs um, that was explored, exploited during the Caribou Gold Rush. So the story is gold coming out of these mountains at the time, 100 million years ago, eroded volcanoes, igneous rocks, um, and gold being carried 400 kilometers to the Rocky Mountain foothills, where we see them today. If you go to those ridges, and if you look right below them, gather a couple kilograms of material, take it down to the nearest stream. So those rocks have been exposed for 10,000 years at least, since the last glaciation, 15,000 years. They've been weathering away. Material falls, and you can collect that stuff from the bottoms of the cliff. You can take it, pan it, and you can quite often get gold. 15 colors, five colors, sometimes you get a little bit of platinum. Let's continue the story about Drama, another place to go visit and look at. Neutral Hills, east central Alberta, northeast of Calgary, southeast of Edmonton, near Consort. And out in the middle of the prairies there, you see these ridges, and they look like the foothills ridges that you see west of Calgary, west of Edmonton when you're going into Jasper. You go drive through them, and it's very, very beautiful if you catch this in the spring. So the story on the neutral hills is they extend across the prairies for 70 kilometers, up to 120 meters high, the ridges. They were seen, mapped by Captain John Palliser in the mid to late, eight, mid to, we'll call it the middle 1800s, during his ex, um, expedition, and he put them on his maps and wrote, put them into the report. Well, why are they there? The story is glaciers. Glaciers pushed them and thrust them. Glacier ice advanced and pushed the underlying bedrock that was below the ice at the time and in front of the ice and made these ridges. The ice melted back and large blocks of ice became incorporated in some of that debris, and those blocks of ice eventually melted out. The ice would move forward, move back. Um, and so when the ice melted, when it receded, when it retreated, these ice blocks here formed these kettle lakes. This lake here, which is pretty salty, the Gooseberry Lake, which is a provincial park, a beautiful little provincial park, is the result of an ice block that melted there. Here's Gooseberry Lake Provincial Park. Prairie landscape at its best, surrounded by these ice thrust ridges. That's one interpretation. Well, there is another interpretation on why those ridges are there. Middle of the prairies, big ridges, r lots of berries, lots of trees between the ridges, um, protection from the wind. So the Crow and the Blackfoot people lived in this area to take advantage of the resources that were there. They got into fights, they got into battles, they got into skirmishes. Um, one day, the great, one night, the Great Spirit was upset with them fighting. So he put his finger down and he lifted up these ridges. 
on either side of this little valley that goes right through the middle. In the morning, the two tribes woke up. The crow walked on one side, the Blackfoot walk, walked along on the other side, and they met in this valley, and they, they smoked a peace pipe. This is an unattributed story. We don't know where it came from, but it is in the literature. Um, it's another interpretation. Neutral hills. They smoked the peace pipe, and this was an area of neutrality for the Crow and the Blackfoot people. Let's go into southwest Alberta. Wally's Beach. More drama. A hike within a late Pleistocene landscape. Pleistocene was the time of the glaciers. So we're going to go to St. Mary, um, Mary Reservoir. It's southwest of McGrath, northeast of Waterton Lakes National Park. You can see the Rocky Mountains in the distance. And there is a reservoir just in the distance here. In the middle of the summer, water level is high, and there's a beautiful little provincial park at Wally's Beach, that, and it's new, opened last year. And it's a beautiful little rustic park to go see these features. You can see the reservoir off in the distance. So right now, meaning March, April, maybe in September, October, you could go for a walk out to here, and when you get there, you might find these features. These are mammoth footprints. These are mammoth trackways. Mammoth walked along through here. Here's some in mud. Here's some in sand. They've, the archaeologists and the paleontologists, the paleontologists have found about 500 tracks here. There's one of these mammoth footprints. Here is either a camel or a prehistoric horse footprint in the same type of material. These are dated at about 13,300 years ago. The archaeologists, they found and they identified seven butchered horses and camels here. They found stone tools that were used to butcher the horses and the camels. And they found proteins on those tools. These aren't the tools that I'm showing pictures. These are other tools that you could, might be able to see out there. They found proteins on some of these tools. Here's some pictures of bones from that time, as well as some of the tools. A stone tool in the top right, an arrowhead here. You just look at this, um, there was ice on the reservoir at the time, and you can imagine how bleak it was 13,300 13, years ago. It was harsh and cold. Wind was blowing here all the time, coming off the ice. The big Laurentide ice sheet, the big continental glaciation, glacier had receded to the north several hundred kilometers. There were very few trees probably, and it was step-like, mostly grass and shrubs and herbs. There's Lucy's rendition of Wally's Beach. More drama. Dinosaurs perish, meteor impacts, and never-ending floods. The Red Deer River Valley, wherever you go explore, is beautiful. This right For this part of the story, and what we're going to talk about, we're going to Dry Island Buffalo Jump. And what we're going to do, drop down into one of the ridges over to the right of the imagery, and you're going to find a ridge, something like this, and you're going to go up it. And the paleontologist, we're going to, there's a story here to what the paleontologist found. But if you go up and if you watch these gullies, look in these gullies, you might be able to find bones. There's a bone right here. There's a little piece of a turtle, carapace, right here. There's a knuckle bone, probably of a dinosaur or some sort, or some sort of reptile here. And there's a piece of petrified wood right there. So the story here is the paleontologist excavated at the turn of the century and then again in the 1990s, dinosaurs, Albertosaurus. They found a bone bed of Albertosaurus. Um, and this is what he would have looked like. They found 26 specimens in that bone bed. Um, they, the specimens aged from 2 to 24 years. They likely hunted in packs. And they say that because there were so many of them and with this age range. So why are there so many? So if you go to um, Africa, Kenya right now, um, you can see animals. These are wildebeest crossing river here in, in Kenya. Wildebeest are vegetarians. They're not carnivores like, like Albertosaurus was, but it gets a point across here. They're crossing the river. Where well, they cross the river and they drowned. They drowned by the thousands. Then they get scavenged, and then you just have bones left with bits and pieces of, of, uh, of skin. The next river, next time the river floods, 
it picks up these carcasses, these bones, takes them downstream and deposits them on the side of a river, on the bar of a river. And that's what the paleontologists were excavating to give you the bone beds. More drama um, that you can see here. 66.5 million years ago, a dry island buffalo, or not at dry island buffalo jump, a meteorite hit the earth. It was 20 kilometers across. It created a crater in the Yucatan Peninsula that was 200 kilometers across. At Dry Island Buffalo Jump, you can see the instant in time when that crater hit the earth. It's right at the base of this coal seam on this cliff at the park. If you go a few kilometers downstream, there is that instant in time where the meteor hit. And they find evidence of it. They find iridium. And higher levels of, irid of iridium, which comes from space, they find shocked quartz, which resulted from the impact. And again, you get a picture of how beautiful that river valley is there. When a meteorite hits the earth, it's a cataclysm. Instantly, there are giant fires. There were giant fires. Um, darkness prevailed for hundreds to thousands of years from the ejected debris and soot. Um, nitric acid rain, sulfuric acid, aerosols, it cooled the earth. They call that nuclear winter. And then CO2, cartridge, CO2 levels became so high because the meteorite hit a, a, an area of reefs, lots of, lots of carbonates. So we had intense warming. When the meteorite hit, 76% of all species perished on Earth. It was a cataclysm. Let's look at glaciers and volcanoes long past in Alberta. Alberta was covered by up to four kilometers of ice. That's a lot. Next time, when you go outside, or when you go outside tomorrow, look up. In the Edmonton area, there was three kilometers. Calgary area, a kilometer and a half of ice. And if you look, draw a line and look at the thickness of the ice from north, in the ter Northwest Territories, to Montana border, you can see that ice and how it thinned southwards. It actually flowed upslope. This is the topography from the Northwest Territories to Montana. It actually flowed upslope. So much ice, and then when that ice melted, it, it gave us so much of the landscape in Alberta. 21,000 years ago, we were covered by ice, except for a few places, Porcupine Hills, Cypress Hills. The ice started to melt. The ice started to melt, and there were glacial lakes at the front of it. Those glacial lakes, gave us spectacular channels like this. This is Verdigris Coulee. When you drive across the prairies of Alberta, you see these flat floored, steep walled valleys everywhere. Whenever you drive through them, they were probably a lake which drained catastrophically. Here's Milk River Canyon. That canyon was cut by a large glacial lake that drained catastrophically. And now it's occupied by the, the Milk River. The ice continues to melt. By 10,000 years ago, it had left Alberta. So what did the glaciers do to some of our landscape? Let's look at Okotoks. Let's go to the Okotoks erratic, um, Big Rock. South of Calgary, go to the, little t the town, not the little town, the small city of Okotoks, and a little bit west, we've got the Okotoks erratic. Why is it there? Well. 21,000 years ago, more or less, when the glaciers were at the maximum, there were two ice sheets, the Laurentide Ice Sheet and the Cordilleran Ice Sheet, the mountain glaciers. They met and they converged right in this area here. Go to Jasper, Mount Edith Cavell. There was a landslide and hundreds of millions of tons of material from Mount Edith Cavell fell onto a glacier. That glacier flowed north, hit, went, got to Hinton, and then it bumped into the giant Laurentide ice sheet and was deflected southwards. When the glaciers melted, large blocks of rocks, like the Okotoks erratic, were deposited. Here's a picture of Mount Edith Cavell. A kilometer of this quartzite, it, it, it's a kilometer thick. There was an avalanche onto a glacier here, and again, out to Hinton, deflected southwards. Here's an example of where that happens today. Let's go to the Alaska Range. In Alaska, two mountains here. There would have been an earthquake, and the sides of those mountains collapsed, giant landslide, onto the glacier. 
just story for the Okotoks erratic. Some of those erratics are scattered all through Calgary. Here's one on Nose, a couple on Nose Hill. So let's look at Calgary a little bit. Story in Calgary, and here we're going to go to Hawkwood, one of the communities um, in North Calgary. And if you look at a panorama from Nose Hill, down, you can see downtown Calgary, Bow River Valley, Signal Hill in the distance, Rocky Mountains way in the distance, and Cochrane would be in here 20 kilometers to the west. At the time of the glaciation, when the ice were melting, there was the Laurentide ice sheet, the big ice sheet here, the big ice sheet here, or smaller one here. This was the, the one that was flowing from the Rocky Mountains. The ice was melting, and we had a big lake being formed in Calgary, Glacial Lake Calgary. In Calgary, north part of Calgary, is a beautiful park called Nose Hill, and the lake lapped up around the margins of Nose Hill. The university would have been under about 40 meters of water, where we are now in downtown Calgary, probably 100 meters of water under Glacial Lake Calgary. Glacial Lake Calgary was as high as this road, and all this area in the background would have been under it. The first glaciation that came from Cal that covered Calgary came from the west, came from the Rocky Mountains. And then we had the Laurentide Ice Sheet. And all I'm showing you is what this glacial lake looks like. Remember, all this ice was melting, so there's so much water. And it was so responsible for so much of the landscape that we see in Alberta. The ice is melting. And that is all forms of glacial lake Calgary. Let's stay with the glacial theme. Let's go look at disruption in the prairies. Let's go to Mud Buttes. So it's south of the, the neutral hills. And what you see at Mud Buttes are these thrust ridges with beautiful, beautiful, subtle colors. A friend of mine takes black and white photos of these, and they're just absolutely amazing. So you're in the middle of the prairies, and you see these beautiful pastels here. So this is called Mud Buttes. The story on them, again, glaciers coming from the north, bulldozed bedrock and contorted the bedrock in front of it. Let's go to Elk Island National Park, um, east of Edmonton. Um, and it, it's a story related to the glaciers. And it's a wetland. Birds love it. Beavers love it. Low it consists of low-lying hills, shallow lakes, and all of these wetlands in through here. The story on Elk Island National Park is that it was a highland, a, just a very subtle highland during the last glaciation. So the, Western Canada was covered by ice, and the ice would stream on either side of that little highland. And it would stream along at a few hundred meters per year. So the glaciologists say that's streaming along really, really fast. There is Elk Island National Park. Remember, it was covered by about three kilometers of ice. And you can see this wetland topography all through the middle of the area, and then this flat streamlined area to the east and to the west. And you can picture how the ice streamed around that highland. If you draw a line from southwest to northeast, you can draw the elevation of the topography. And you can see Elk Island National Park is actually on this little topographic high. When the ice started to melt, there was a giant block of ice tens of kilometers across, perhaps up to a kilometer thick, and it stagnated in place. It stagnated and melted and gave you that ter terrain, that topography that you see there, the wetlands that birds love. It's got many names, um, this topography, and the names don't matter except they're descriptive. Prairie mounds, rimmed ridges, ice-walled lake plains, prairie donuts. I think that exemplifies the parks there. And just, it's beautiful. I mean, you've got algae growing on the lake. You can see beaver dams way in the distance. You can see drowned birch trees in the foreground and poplar trees. Volcanoes long past. For this one, there's not many volcanoes um, volcano deposits in Western Canada, or in Alberta, let's put it that way. But let's go to Dorothy, along the Red Deer River Valley. Dorothy is an abandoned hamlet. It's got a lower status than a hamlet. It's abandoned. Uh, there's a few people that live there. And the interesting thing is, there's two churches. 
that provide backdrops for what we see here, this gray layer that's up to 13 meters thick. So there's one church, you look across the parking lot, and there's the other church. Um, pretty well abandoned now, little tourist place. 73, call it 74 million years ago, there was a volcanic eruption somewhere in British Columbia, maybe a little bit south in Washington. And the eruption deposited all of this light gray material, which is volcanic ash, into these mud rocks, which was an old ocean, an old seaway. Alberta, in this pathway here, would have been pitch black, I'm sure, without much ash in the atmosphere at the time. So there's the church with the ash in the backdrop. And from the Dorothy area, you can see this ash all along the river valley of the Red Deer River Valley, south of Drumheller. The scenic geology of Alberta is about when banks fail. For this, we're going to go to Edmonton. And Edmonton too, like Calgary, is built on lake deposits. There was a glacial lake here. And that's why Edmonton is so flat. It's built on the bottom of an ancient glacial lake. 13, uh, we'll call it 15,000 years old. There was ice on all sides, except to the west. And that ice created a dam, and it created this lake, and you can see where Edmonton was built. As a result, Edmonton is one of the flattest cities we've got in the province. It's one of the flatter cities in the prairies. The only highland topography you've got are these high rises. When the land, after the glaciers melted, the land started to rise up, and the North Saskatchewan River became entrenched. This is a Lesku River Valley Park. Terwilliger Park is off in the distance here. The North Saskatchewan River, it's a meandering river, and so it erodes on one side, and then it comes along, and it erodes on the other side of the river. It deposits opposite where you get erosion. You get these point bars being deposited. That, these are deposits of sand and gravel. Early in the city's history, and it doesn't matter if it's Calgary's history, or Edmonton's history, or Saskatoon's city, uh, history, you take that sand and gravel and use it from gravel pits. Later on, you make it into parks. Sometimes you make these, this point bar where deposition occurred into golf courses. Well, well, where erosion occurs, you get bank failure, you get slumping. The river undercuts the river and you get this failure. You get houses collapsing down. Um, you, we talk about volcanoes, volcanic ashes. They're really, really slippery when they get wet. Well, some of these bank collapses quite often occur on these volcanic ash layers called bentonites. There used to be a road right here called Keeler Road. Well, 1989, North Saskatchewan River eroded here and the bank down dropped. Bank down dropped here in 2002. So what the city of Edmonton decided to do was make this old road into a pretty little park. What I was told, it used to be a place where people used to like to go drink, um, a lot of drugs and parties going on. Well, they tried to tame it and make it into this pretty, pretty little park where you get an overview of the river. When banks fail, let's go up north. Let's go to Peace River at the town of Peace River. And what you see on the Peace River is the Smoky River flowing into it. And you can see where the river is impinging on the left side of the banks. So wherever I have an S is a slump. It's a bank failure. There is the highway going through here. There is the railroad bridge going through here. This area is in motion, moving all the time when banks fail. So the railroad and the provincial government and the city, uh, city of Peace River, the town of Peace River, they're always repairing that road. When banks fail, Crow's Nest Pass shook violently. So let's go down into southern Alberta, Highway 3, west of Lethbridge, and look at the Frank Slide. Really, 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 really a devastating event. 1903, April 29th, uh, Turtle Mountain let loose right here. It is Canada's largest landslide. Um, the railway 
and the highway were both blocked at the base of the valley. Half the town of Frank was destroyed and at least 90 people died. We don't know the total, but they say at least 90 people. So why did it happen? Here's Turtle Mountain and you can see how steep it is. You can see loose material. When you're quite often down below the mountain, you'll see or hear blocks come tumbling down. Well, the reason that the Frank Slide took place, reason Turtle Mountain looks the way it is, is these rocks were thrusted, they were pushed by mountain building processes. Then they were folded. Actually, it was, they were folded first. And when you fold rocks, you weaken them. Then they were thrust by mountain building. Then there's been glaciations here for the last 2.6 million years. That's oversteepened this mountain. Some people suggest that the coal mining that was going on at the time, at the base of the mountain, contributed to the failure. So many causes. And as a result, you've got these large blocks that came down from Turtle Mountain, went up the other side of the valley wall. This is the north side of the valley. Early scientists, early science suggested these blocks rode up on a cushion of air. I'm not sure if that's really accepted anymore. So the scenic geology of Alberta is a story about unbridled power. It's a story about drama. It's a story about glaciers and volcanoes long past. It's a story about when banks fail. So what I've tried to do is take you across Alberta to many of the scenic sites, and there's lots more, and then explain how they got there so that you can have an, appre an appreciation of the aesthetics as well as the origins of those rocks. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I'd like to acknowledge the Canadian Geological Foundation uh, for a grant to publish my book. I'd also like to acknowledge the Alberta government for a grant to publish the book. My, both, both appreciated. If you're interested in buying the book, right here in the camera store, it's the place to get it. Um, they've got copies for sale here and it's in just about every other bookstore across Alberta. So thank you very much for your time. appreciation for geology but not anywhere close to the depths that you are are looking at so a lot of the features I've been to Frank slide is really amazing if you get a chance to go down there the the, the sheer volume and the size of the rocks and you yeah. like, try to envision that time right and there's, there's you know, rocks the size of mountains that used to be over there are now over yeah, there. The size of this building, exactly Dave. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing there so um, I noticed you use um, like uh, tools, like you use uh, Google Earth. Has it changed the way you work as a geologist? Yeah, it is. Um, because with Google Earth, and I really like it because I can go exploring, especially when I'm writing the book and I can't remember certain things. And then you can go from 2D view to 3D view. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can rotate around. I, I use it all the time. That's fantastic. Yeah. And so what makes Alberta's geology sort of unique from other parts of, of Canada? I mean, we have, if you've never been to Calgary, it's fairly amazing because you can go an hour in any direction yeah. and it's drastically different. So, so the reason for that is because we've got the mountains to the west. And it, I didn't talk about it today, but <clears throat> our mountains aren't being formed today. Our mountains are being eroded. Mm. And, and if you go to Banff and you look up above Banff, there's probably been seven kilometers of material eroded. You go to Jasper, the same thing. Here, above Calgary, there's been about a kilometer and a half of material eroded wow. from above you. So most of Western Canada is a landscape of erosion. And that's why it's so different um, from the rest of the country that you're talking about. You can add more to it, but I like to think of it, call it a landscape of erosion, which gives you this great scenery. So if you're like a... a burdening a, a geologist, what is like a great spot for, uh, for somebody to go see? If they have a, like a top three must-see list in... in a, okay, uh, I'm going to do the top three. And one of the top three is going to be Milk River Canyon. So not riding on Stone Provincial Park, but go east on the gravel roads into our ranch lands, and then south, and it's just about on the border, and you've got this really steep canyon, you've got a, you've got a misfit stream below. Um, Smithsfit. That just means there's no way that Milk River could have cut that canyon. And it's so spectacular there. And I just love that scenery. Another one that I really, really like to go see, sorry, I'm just thinking here, and it's, it's, it's 
it is, sorry, the Icefields Parkway. And, and the Icefields Parkway, it is so spectacular to see the mountains, to see the main ranges of the mountains, the resistant ridges of the mountains, um, and especially, and I call it, on a blue sky day. And then the third one, which is just, it's kind of neat and it's kind of interesting, is going to be, I'm just thinking here, which I want to say, I'm going <laughs> to take you into Kananaskis country. And we're going to go see what people call the rock glacier. Mm. And it's not really a rock glacier. It's something else. It's a weathering phenomenal phenomena. Engineers call it a topple. And I just like to see that one. So Kananaskis country, highway west of Calgary, highway 40 going south. And it's called Rock Glacier, and it's right beside the Highwood Pass. And, and it is really, really an interesting area because you can see how mountains are being eroded. And if you get lucky, you're going to see pikas there, you're going to see mountain goats there, and you might see hoary marmots there. And they're living in that mountain alpine terrain, which goes hand in hand. Basically, the, the, the debris flows, the rock material provides habitat for those animals. And hmm. it's kind of a relationship between animals and what we see in the mountains there. Yeah, I've done a, a Ptarmigan Cirque, which isn't too far away Bingo. from there. Right? And the same thing, you walk into it and you're just like, this. it's this theater of rock. And you're like, wow, there's things living there. I agree, it's, uh, it's impressive to actually go see. Yes. Now, with more Albertans traveling around the province with COVID, we are certainly uh, <laughs> yep. exploring our province a lot more. Um, what are things that we can do to help preserve these geological areas? You mentioned a lot of things like the ash that's very slippery and are people you know, you know, destroying some of this stuff? Or? Yeah, they are. And I, and, and, yeah, but you can't <laughs> keep people to go out explo from exploring. We want them to go explore. And so if there's paths, stay on the paths. I showed you pictures of fossils. Well, leave the fossils in the ground. It is legal to pick those fossils up that I showed you because they've been reworked and they've been transported. But maybe leave them there for somebody else to look at. Never pick a flower. Don't move the rocks around. You know, the rules that we have in our federal national, national parks is leave it the way you see it. And that's kind of my attitude for most of Alberta um, in, in our provincial parks, in our recreational areas. Just leave it the way it is. I know it's hard to do really really try. Well I know down in uh, uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park they've got structures set up where they've got the fossils that they've uncovered but they've built enclosures around them so you can see inside and it's really impressive to think about what the history that went on here uh, talking about the animal prints from you know you know several thousand years ago you know you, you have a trained eye so you can see that. Yeah. Is there any sort of tips and techniques or tricks that you you use or is it just that you're a PhD and you know everything about No, this? it's not. <laughs> I mean, any amateur can do it, especially if you get the book or my book, somebody else's books, and, and you're, you're told what to go look for and where to go look for them. And, and you follow those. And you don't want a really technical book. You just want to highlight and high grade it. And, and I think that's the way to do it. And what I try to do in the books is I've got maps. I tell people where to park and I tell if there's hikes in the area, I tell them where to go look at things. Um, Red Rock Canyon in Waterton Lakes. Um, you can go see this ancient shoreline. You can see mud cracks. You can see those algae that lived 1.5 billion years ago. Go look for features like that. And that's that's kind of what I would suggest. Uh, now, forget, the, use me and the books as the tool to explore is the way I would look at it. You don't need a PhD. <laughs> you just need an eye and to appreciate it. Well, during your presentation, I was you know, scanning through your book and looking through the book, and there's a question posed about are the pictures that we saw from your presentation in the book, right? And they, they all are from what I can tell. Yeah, just about but, every one is. Yeah. Well, what I like about your book is that it's not, you've, you've taken a very, potentially very dry subject. As I, you know? you're right. No, you're 100% right. <laughs> I mean, hey, let's talk about rocks, you know? And then the whole crowd just fades away. But, you know, with your book there, it's, it's interesting, it's well worded, um, they're short stories, they're not over the top, but you get everything you need out of it, a complete different appreciation for what's around us. So, you know, you know that's fantastic, it's a, it's, a, it's a great guidebook. That's really so. good to hear, because that's, that's what I wrote it for. I, again, I didn't write it for my colleagues, those geologists that <laughs> fill downtown Calgary. I wrote it for the tourists, the travelers, people who appreciate natural history. So that was actually a question. So from one, you know, with all your geologist buddies, what is the, 
the geekiest uh, geological feature in Alberta for you guys to totally geek out on. Oh, <laughs> oh Mount Yamnuska. Mm. We go to, you know, everybody knows where Mount Yamnuska is. It's the leading edge of the Rocky Mountain Front Ranges. And so that's the one that I'll say, it's the geeky one we look at. <laughs> everybody knows about it. And they, they talk about it. And there's these, the top of Mount Yamnuska are rocks that are 400 million years old. And they were pushed on top of rocks that are about 180 million, or they're about 80 million years old. And the old rocks are really resistant to erosion. And that's why people like to hike up there. And that's why they climb on that face. But yeah, I think that's one that we geek about. <laughs> so uh, what's next for you? What's uh, we do in Northern Alberta? Are we going to go? Uh, oh, actually, I'm working on a book, and it's uh, it's 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 really it's it's uh, moving along, coming along really nicely, and I just bought a camera here about three weeks <laughs> ago to help me with it too. Um, it's going to be the relationship of wildlife distribution to geology or to mm. landscapes. Mm. So, for instance, the Rocky Mountains. To the west, the front ranges. We just mentioned Mount Yamnuska. Well, where do eagles soar? You, everybody's heard about the golden eagles soaring yeah. north and south when they migrate. Well, they're coming up. Winds blowing up the sorry, the winds blowing up the thrush sheets as well as uh, thermals, and you know, things like that. I can just go on and on and on, covering the whole province. If you're interested in sturgeon, you know the big fish. Yeah. Well, where does stu sturgeon live in rivers? They live in meandering rivers. They lay their eggs where the water is shallower. We call them riffles. Then they feed in pools for the rest of the year. That's what I'm going to, and so I'm going to take people around the province looking at wildlife as well as looking at landscape and merging the two of them together. Well, it is really impressive, you know, how you know, the landscape has um, you know, changed migration of, of birds and animals and all kinds of stuff and where it's all taken. So, I mean, yeah, this is a fantastic book. I have to admit, you know, uh, you know I mean, it's kind of a dry subject, but you've really jazzed it up and made it something that's really interesting. And I know I'm certainly not going to look at the same formations the same. I go through, you know, when I'm driving around and the mountains and stuff, you're always wondering, you know, why or how did this come about? Yeah. So. Uh, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I encourage you guys to take a look through this book here because you're going to learn something. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting uh, with this. So I want to thank everybody for sticking around and watching this entire presentation. It's very interesting. I like this topic a lot more than I thought I would, I have to admit. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting to learn more about what's around you because you know, they've been around for a lot longer than we have. So yep. once again, thank you for the, the presentation there and for the TCSDB Live Dream Team for keeping us on track tonight. And hope you guys like what you see. If you got more questions, don't hesitate. Give me a shout, Dave at the camera store.com, and we'll catch you again later. Thanks a lot, Dave, and thanks along to the camera store. All right. Take care. <laughs>